Hello everyone, my name is Brianna Curl and I will be your moderator for today's webinar on designing for our app when the signal meets the board. And I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar and introduce you to our presenters Jim Carroll and Orlin Bates. Jim has over 25 years of experience in MMIC and RF board design from frequencies up through W band. Previously, he was AWR's director of IC design flows. Before that, Jim was a Raytheon and TriQuint. Jim holds a PhD and master's in electrical engineering from Texas A&M University. Orlin is a senior field application engineer and has been with EMA since 2002 and has been in the PCB design field since 1973. Orlin attended vocational tech school, earning a degree in directing and design technologies. Jim will be presenting followed by the demonstration given by Orlin and Jim. Assuming we have time at the end, we will field some questions in a formal Q&A. Thank you for your attention. And now over to you, Jim. Thank you, Brianna. I really appreciate everyone coming to attend our seminar today, Designing for RF When the Signal Meets the Board, or What You Need to Know for Success. Nowadays, it's more and more common for people to integrate RF sections into your PCB designs, which can be very challenging for design groups because the two worlds, the RF world and the PCB design world, have been pretty much separate for a long time, but now they're getting closer and closer as these integrations are becoming more and more common. So we'll show you some flows that have been created to help improve that integration. And we'll do that by this agenda where we'll talk a little bit about what is RF design, some common RF terms, why is RF design and analysis important, RF design's challenges and solutions, Hopefully through the presentation, Orlin and I will be giving some tidbits on best practices. We'll show you an example flow and then have question and answers at the end if we have time. We have a very diverse group of attendees, and so some of this might be a little bit basic, but what is RF design? Radio frequency, or RF, refers to electromagnetic wave propagation in the 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz range. Basically, we want to propagate or send signals from point to point. In the past, at low frequencies for, let's say, uh, radio or TV that was done below 3 gigahertz in the uh, kilohertz and megahertz ranges, we call that low frequency. But uh, recently, in the past couple of decades, the microwave frequencies part of the spectrum has been very, very interesting, and that's in the 3 to 30 gigahertz. So things like Wi-Fi, SATCOM, or satellite communications, and Bluetooth are all examples of applications that are in this frequency range. More recently, millimeter waves, people have been using that term quite a bit because of the excitement around the 5G spectrum, which is somewhere in the low 30 gigahertz, 28 to 30 gigahertz, and mid 40 gigahertz. But the millimeter wave frequencies go from 30 to 300 gigahertz. So there's a lot of bandwidth up in those frequencies, and that has some high interest for a lot of people who want to send a lot of information in a short amount of time. So the energy propagation of these waves can be in different types of media. Through the use of antennas, we can go through the air from location to location. But most of this seminar is going to concentrate on propagation on the PCB, that is the copper traces that you're putting on your PCB to move the RF information around the board and perform various functions like amplification or filtering. So the first thing that RF designers learn when they start doing design is that theoretically RF design scale or frequency. So you can take a filter or a component at one gigahertz and use pretty much the same RF topologies at 10 gigahertz and all the component values just scale. The problem and the tough part about RF design is that it's the implementation at the higher frequencies that really creates the challenges to going higher and higher frequency. Because as you start having impairments creep in at the higher frequencies, that then cause the designer to have to change or modify their design. So what is RF design? Basically, it's striving to ensure that the components and wave propagation in whatever media you're using are as efficient as possible. So again, we have a, a diverse group of people in the webinar. I'll be throwing around a lot of these terms, frequency, wavelength, RF power, decibels, or dBs, gain, return loss, modulation, SMIP chart. And we don't have enough time to go through all these terms. 
If you're not familiar with the terms, certainly there's a lot of places on the internet that you can go look them up, like Wikipedia, RF Cafe, Mark Waits and RF Magazine are good resources. I've always found if I want some really great down-to-earth explanations of all these terms and a lot of things RF, my go-to resource is this markwaves101.com, which is an ad-free site put together by an RF engineer who uh, I think has done the RF industry a great service putting that together for us. So I, I encourage you to go there if you're interested on any of the topics we talk about. So why is RF design important? Essentially, it's because we're placing our important information on the RF waves and then using those RF waves to ferry that information where we want them to go. So whether that's through the air or from one part of your board to another, where that information can be either voice or video modulation, or more recently, it seems like everything's going digital with the uh, cheap A to Ds and D to A converters that we have now that you can actually integrate onto your board. If you don't do good RF design, you get poor RF system performance. That can manifest itself in a number of ways. One would be low signal levels, and no one likes low signal level. That uh, means you can't hear the signal very well and you need a lot of amplification. Or it can lead to lower transfer rates because of perhaps more system noise on your signal, which hinders you being able to tease out that information that you've actually put onto those RF waves. Or you might even have high levels of interference across your board or even distortion of the signal, which causes difficulty in demodulating the information and getting it back out of the signal. So as we go on, more and more of the PCB products are incorporating RF into their designs. That's what we've been seeing in the industry. And of course, this is also happening at the time where we're going higher and higher frequencies. And the level of integration and the compactness of these systems and PCBs and RF systems on the PCB boards has become uh, higher and higher and more and more compact. But if you do it right, you can actually have better system performance overall. And with that tight integration of the RF onto the PCB, you can actually have lower system costs. So the design challenges then for the PCB designer and the RF designer can only be solved with pretty much only one thing analysis and what I like to say is simulation, simulation, simulation. And the reason is the amount of time it takes you to do a design, then go fabricate it on whatever media, board, or even IC, go into the lab and do cut and try lab engineering with exacto knights and, and copper tape, and then feed that back into the design as improvements, it's just really costly and causes a very slow development time. So analysis and simulation up front can allow you to do all those virtual experiments in the CAD tool so then you can incorporate those changes directly into your PCB and have hopefully a first pass success or at least one that's better than it was without the simulation. Now the issue with that is you need accurate models to produce the correct results. If you don't have accurate models of all your components, then your simulations won't mean anything, junk in, junk out. So the, one of the challenges for the RF designers is that the layouts themselves, you can draw whatever you want as copper traces on your board, and I might not have a model for that because there's just no one model. So those layouts have very unintended consequences that can then degrade my RF performance in the RF sections of my PCB. So for example, uh, I show what's called a hairpin bandpass filter. A bandpass filter will allow certain frequencies to go through from the input of this bandpass filter here on the left to the output. It'll allow certain frequencies to go through and it filters out other frequencies that are outside that band. And this is a very useful component in most systems. The person who laid this out created a five section, what's called hairpin resonant structure in order to do that filtering. And these lengths, widths, and coupling values determined by the spacing in between these sections are all very important to the filter design. And so you can understand that depending on how you laid things out, for example, this corner, whether it was a true corner or a mitered corner, can have different consequences in terms of frequency because it could introduce more capacitance or higher resistance in that particular section of your design. You can also get what's called 
the low frequency guys call signal sneak pass. That is, you may be putting your RF uh, on the input of this filter and it goes through the filter through normal propagation. But you could also have propagation around the filter, either in the air or in the substrate. And that unintended coupling affects the out of band performance in particular for this type of filter. So you need to correctly model that as well. Also, if depending on what kind of material you put this on, FR4 or some of the higher frequency materials like Rogers or Arlon, those materials have different dielectric constants. Those dielectric constants will vary over frequency. And so if you're doing this filter at one gigahertz, it may scale somewhat up to 10 gigahertz if you were to redesign it. But the different electrical characteristics mean you probably will have to change your design in order to make it work well at 10. And then as you go higher and higher in frequency, the RF losses and then radiation of all these structures becomes a greater and greater problem, taking away your performance of, in this case, this particular filter. So what do you do for the PCB traces where their RF is riding along these microstrips and ground signal ground transmission lines? Well, you're gonna create what we call a layout-based model. And creating a model from these RF circuits is achieved through what's called electromagnetic simulation or EM simulation more commonly. And it involves uh, basically Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations describe the fields and currents in the RF world. And what you can do is you can grab your RF sections of your board. And for example, this bandpass filter. You can tell the software that's going to do this electromagnetic analysis where the access points are to this filter. For example, port one on the left and port two on the, on the right. And I will essentially tell it to go ahead and create me a two port model or a black box model, taking into account all the electromagnetic interactions of everything in this particular bandpass filter. Now it does that by first slicing up the problem into something it can better understand and simulate. And so I show the EM simulation mesh on the right-hand side, where it's taken the original layout and then created tiny squares and triangles along the layout so that it can then use Maxwell's equations to write equations describing the interaction between all these mesh points or edges. And then it takes all those equations, puts them in a giant matrix, solves the matrix, and then it's able to then give you your black box model. Now there are lots of different computational electromagnetic packages out there. It's, this is technology that's literally decades old. It's always gotten better because of better computers and better computational numeric algorithms. But the three big ones are for this EM analysis are called method of moments, finite element, and then finite difference time domain as well. They all have their advantages and disadvantages, uh, each of those different methods. They're all solving Maxwell's equations just in different ways, but the flow is very similar. You take your layout, you put on ports, and your stack up, you mesh it up, write the matrix, solve, and then you have your answer. And when you have that answer, it takes into account everything including not only the metal traces and their losses, but the substrates. It could be multiple layers of different substrates, ground planes, radiation. These electromagnetic analysis tools take all that into account. And you get a very high fidelity model of this layout. So what do you do with that layout-based model? So I have a little layout-based model of the patch simulations we're going to show in just a little bit up in the top left all meshed up, what do you do with that once you solve it? Well, you can stick it into your system or your circuit design, and you can see here an example design where there's some RF sections on the left, including two hairpin filters, one in particular a hairpin filter in the middle of this with the red box. So I could take my two port model, my, my black box representation of this part of the layout, and stick it in to this RF chain and figure out the entire response for the whole circuit, piece by piece. I can then do linear simulations in an RF simulator uh, or even SPICE simulator. I can do nonlinear simulations with it, 
since it's just a black box model. Uh, all these EM models are just basically linear models. And then even run that through a system simulator with modulation, like you see in this picture, where you could understand how that filter affects even the system specs for the modulation. You can also, one of the nice things about the, the layout-based models and the uh, EM tools is if you do have issues with the RF circuits, which often you do, it gives you visualization tools. For example, in this case, I, I show the RF currents and where they're highest in the filter at some particular frequency. It happen, happens to be mid-band, but I can look sometimes use these tools to visualize RF currents and where there may be crowding or issues or unintended coupling across the filter that I wouldn't normally be able to do just looking at the copper traces in Allegro or ORCAD. Uh, I would need this tool in order to do the analysis to see this and how it's going to perform. Now, of course, once you have the currents and the fields from the electromagnetic simulator, you can also do antenna patterns which is a simple antenna theory. So a lot of these EM tools will also plot out your antenna patterns for you. So if you have that kind of interest, uh, these tools can do this too. So we have a couple of different RF PCB flows uh, I'll show you. In particular, there's what I call low density PCB for RF. That's basically low layer count and component count, maybe less than 50 surface mount devices. The layout requirements for this, since it's all RF, are pretty lax and not very complicated. The library requirements and the stack up requirements are pretty simple. And so a lot of times RF tools can handle this type of design. So if you're just doing a small filter or even perhaps a little eval board, <laughs> only a few components, a lot of that can be done in, in the RF tools. But we don't see that so much anymore. What we see more and more is the integration of that low density PCB onto a much higher density PCB containing the digital and analog and mixed signal parts on the same board. So a lot of these we've been seeing lately are hundreds of digital parts or mixed signal parts with things running everywhere and then small sections, 20 or 30% RF sections that do the work of the RF content on the board. Normally, we see these are always being driven by the enterprise PCB tools, like the Allegro or CAD tools. Everything's being done there. Their layout tools on the enterprise level are much more well-suited for these larger boards. But RF simulation still has to be done. So the RF content is then usually transferred to an RF tool for analysis to essentially validate the RF performance and that it's working correctly before they go to fab. And then in the RF tool, modifications can be made and exported back into the uh, enterprise PCB tool like Allegro. And that's the flow we're going to be showing today. But then as things get more and more compact, larger and larger integration, certainly the future is going to be much higher density, much more RF content on the boards, much more higher integration. And believe me, there are much more seamless flows on the way from the tool vendors like Cadence. So with that, we'll... Uh, show a quick demo of this validation flow and, and how that works. Orlin? So Jim, what we need to do here is if you're viewing the board here, we have the antenna and I have a, a section of that antenna on layer three because we're kind of compressed for space. So I need you to simulate and tell me if we're good with these antenna, part of it being on layer three. If not, I'll need to move the large chip out of there and bring everything to the surface. So right now, I will go ahead and close off layer three. So we're just looking at, at the top layer. Now I know RF circuits work better when they're out there in the fresh air. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove this mask off of this. So quickly I can come up here under edit and we have what's called a cross copy. And I'll come over here to the options and we'll change this from board geometry obviously down to the solder mask top, and I'm going to create an opening for that. Pads only, but I'll go ahead and do pads and holes. The hole should be already open for solder mask, but I'll just make sure it's done. Afterwards, I want to go ahead and merge everything when I'm all done, so we'll merge. Now, what I can do is go in here and just click on a particular uh, section of that, but in this case here, we really want the whole thing open. 
So it'd be better for me to make a temp group and just window all this to grab everything at one time. And then I'll just tell it that it's complete. And now you can see that I've got solder mask opening clear across here. That'll uh, obviously best be used as gold plated at the end to protect those circuits. But now we have solder mask opening. I'll come over here to our design flow and just uh, open that up now. And I'm going to deliver to you IPC 2581. Uh, I could just send you the design fabrication, but it'd be better for me to just send you the whole design level three. You'll get everything that you need. We'll change this from microns over to millimeters. And then I'll just export that file out to you. The file will and I'll email that over to you. You'll go in and start analyzing it. Uh, there's a few warnings I got, but that'll do, I'll deal with those later in the, the design. So at this point, I'll just go ahead and email that. And I'm um, back to you, Jim, to go ahead and start a simulation on this. So hopefully everyone can see my design environment, which is the Cadence AWR design environment. I've uh, received the IPC 2581 file, which contains all the layout information of the entire PCB from Orlin, our, our PCB expert. And the AWR software has a PCB import wizard that I can double click. And it starts, and you can notice that it has a number of file formats that it supports, Gerber, ODB++, uh, the nice thing about the IPC 2581 that I've seen is that it's a, a single file, so it's highly portable. This file here. It also has uh, all the, the net information in it, as well as layers. So once I click on that file, um, I can go to make sure that it, it has all the information I want and go to the Layers tab, and it I can see that it has uh, the top, layer two, layer three, um, has all the drills. Um, it has the nets have been exported with this particular file as well. So I have 2,200 and some odd nets uh, in this that I'll be able to uh, use as a selection criteria. And then finally, the really great thing is that because Orlin entered in all the information into the stack up editor of Allegro, um, all that information comes over already preset, including all the dielectric values, all the metal thicknesses and conductivities, dielectric constants, and dielectric loss tangents, which are important for the RF performance of this board. Um, in these, I can choose an un select or deselect things I may not want to bring in, but I'm just going to bring everything in. I'm going to add it. And as you saw on Orland's desktop, he had the entire board. He was focusing on this bottom left-hand corner, but the entire board comes in, uh, which means I can now start slicing and dicing this board up and looking at different parts of it. I may want to look at the antennas. Let me uh, turn the cell off. Here's the patch antenna array at the bottom being fed by a ball grid component. I may want to go look at uh, some of these signal lines going back and forth and make sure that they're phase matched or uh, any number of things. I, I, since I have all the artwork, I can uh, start looking at the various pieces. So this particular flow, since we're interested in what Orlin was working on, which is these antennas, I'm going to go and select this part of the board, and I'm going to create what's called a 2D, 3D EM clip region. And the blue box is my clip region. So I can have a bounding box type of, of output uh, or cutout. I can have a, a bounding polygon. So it looks like I selected a couple of these rectangles up at the top or um, uh, just the full outline. I'm just going to do a bounding box. I can uh, go outside of what I had selected by a certain amount, let's say by 0.7 millimeters. I can preview that. And whatever's in this blue box is what I'm going to be sending over to my EM simulator. And I can do that by 
going layout, copy the EM structure. I'm gonna name this my patches. And I have a number of simulators available to me. Uh, I have uh, the Cadence Axiom, AWR Axiom simulator, which is a method of moments. I have the Cadence Finite Element, uh, well, one of their finite element tools called Analyst. Uh, some of the older AWR tools, EM site, I do have the ability to send these to um, third party simulators, uh, HFSS and CST and Sonnet as well. But I'm going to pick the uh, AWR planar 3D simulator Axiom method of moments. And since my stack up already came in, I'm going to just tell it to use the, the default stack up and go create. And I get this interesting window on simplification properties. So when the EM tool meshes up the problem, uh, the more complex the layout, the more meshes there are, and the more meshes there are, the more memory it's going to take and the longer it's going to take to solve. So this AWR tool uh, helps you simplify those geometries so that um, it can take less memory in, in, in your computer. They have a number of ways of doing this. Uh, they allow you to decimate, that's their term for simplify, the paths uh, into polygons, simpler polygons. Uh, you can, they'll also simplify the circles into uh, multi-sided polygons. In this case, I've got uh, the number set for four. So all the circular, circular vias will be uh, decimated or simplified into four-sided polygons. It will take the cutouts and merge them with uh, the floods in order to create a polygon that is more conducive to meshing in, the, in these uh, EM simulators. Um, and then it has some settings that allow you to um, define the, uh, how much it's going to simplify things in terms of some of the layout parameters. Now, honestly, all these settings, sometimes you have to try them several times and then look at the resulting geometries um, and then uh, use, uh, go back and forth until you find what's, what's good for you and what looks good to you as an RF engineer. Well, but uh, suffice it to say, you can uh, play with this several times and it's uh, pretty easy because you can just keep on going back, creating new EM documents and um, see what works. Um, in this case, I think the lines, the single lines were about four or five mils in width, so um, this last setting, which is the minimum path width, I'm gonna set to right around that number. This actually controls some of the mesh settings in terms of how finely it will uh, uh, cut up your geometry. And then I'm gonna go okay, and we'll create my EM document, which is just a small section of my larger board. And I look at it in the 3D view, I can see it's got all the stratified media, all the, all the layer, dielectric layers. And in my simplified layout, um, all the circles have been turned into squares. I could have picked uh, hexagons or octagons or, or even more sides if I wanted. All the curves uh, have been simplified a bit to help that meshing process. And I can go along and I can start editing this document since it's just a copy of the original, taking out things I may not think are important. But once I'm satisfied, oh, let me show you this. I'll go to the enclosure. You can see that the material definitions have been brought in. So the solder mask, ER and tan D, which is a dielectric loss tangent, FR4, uh, has been brought in uh, the core and prepreg materials. It has set up my stack up. So uh, there's solder mask, FR4 going through the, the stack up. To Orland's point, he had mentioned he was going to make a uh, a hole in the uh, in the solder mask for the antennas and for the CPW lines. Um, in this case, it came through his solder mask. Um, but I'm going to just change those, those two layers to air. Uh, you can have total control changing the thicknesses. 
And then the EM mapping, which actually says, hey, top copper is actually on this EM layer on top. Layer two is underneath it, layer three, layer four. The drills have all been brought in as vias in between the layers, blind and uh, buried vias, including the through via. Um, all that has been brought in for you, so then you can quickly get to analyzing the circuit. And the way we would do that, of course, I, I mentioned that you want to place ports. So in this case, since we have a ball grid array, I'm going to select four of these ball grid landing pads, tell it to draw port, which adds what's called an EM port to that polygon. And then in this 3D view, you can see that I've added my access ports. And I can add as many of these ports as I want to my EM documents. Uh, uh, just uh, depends on where you want access to the, the model, how many uh, access points it has. So if I were to mesh this, it would take a couple, two, three minutes. I happen to know that because I've done it already. Um, I've actually saved that mesh um, here, so I don't want to waste time doing that. But here's the same same problem uh, with all the mesh, and you can see the entire all the metal geometries have been broken up into uh, squares and triangles. Um, this uh, the AWR tool does something really nice. It color codes to DC connectivity. So you see that all the pads uh, of the ball grid array are all different colors because they're, they're just pads um, floating out on the, on the top copper. You can see that this uh, port four here is connected all the way through um, to this Wilkinson combiner or divider. Um, and that it goes to the back side and connects to this patch antenna uh, on the back side. Uh, I can run the analysis at whatever frequency I want. Uh, in this case, it's a 28 gigahertz uh, patch array. Uh, I've already done that previously. And hopefully I can show what that looks like. Um, and after the analysis, I asked for the antenna pattern. Uh, which this particular antenna pattern looks a little strange to me. Uh, maybe it was designed this way, um, but maybe not. So what I might be interested in is just seeing if a single patch uh, works correctly, just to kind of break this circuit further apart and understand it a little bit better. So I can go back to, if I want to do that, I can go back to my my board. And I'm gonna pick one of these patches and I can do that really easily since uh, Orlin had uh, made net names in this design. I can select by name. I have all my nets available. I happen to know that this RF antenna is one I want to, want to look like look at by itself. I can uh, zoom out just a little bit. It's highlighting it. Here's the access point going along through the board and then to the patch. So I'm gonna go okay, keep that selected. I'm going to draw another 3D clip region. This time, I'm going to do an outline and ask for, I'm just taking a guess, about 0.6 millimeters around that, which encompasses all the substrate vias. And I'm going to go OK. And this is my new uh, clip region. I'm going to copy this to the EM structure. I'm going to call it my single patch. Take all the defaults for the stack up and axiom. Um, I already put these in. These seem to simplify my circuit pretty well before, so we'll keep them. And now I've clipped out just the uh, single patch by itself, which, since it's a much smaller problem, it will uh, mesh and run much quicker. So I can actually show that in real time. I'm going to add a port on this. This is a, an EM port. And I can ask for the mesh of this, and you can see that in just a few seconds, it's meshed this piece of the circuit that I've clipped out from the much larger PCB. Um, since it's a lot simpler, it's maybe a little bit easier conceptually to see what's going on. 
but I have my signal line going through to what's called a Wilkinson power divider or combiner. And then that goes through the board with these vias. Hopefully those are showing pretty well. And then to the back of the board where the patch antenna is located in yellow. As an RF engineer, I, I notice a couple of things with this kind of highlighting of the uh, traces. I can see that I have four ground planes. Only two of them are connected. The other two are disconnected and just floating, which as an RF engineer, that worries me a little bit. But I can always start doing experiments and looking at the effect of that virtually uh, within the simulator. If I want, let's go look at a quick run of this. It's at 28 gigahertz. I want to save both the currents and the antenna pattern. I can make a graph. And let's go look at what's called the return loss or how well it's matched to 50 ohms at that port one. I'm gonna make a rectangular graph and add a measurement of my linear port S parameters, which are pretty much the standard for looking at these in a month. A single patch and ask for it in DB toggle this guy off so he doesn't run. And I can simulate my measurement, and bring my window over, this goes really quickly. But essentially since I meshed up, the simulator now then goes creating my matrix. So it takes Maxwell's equations, creates the matrix, it then solves the matrix and comes back with my solution at 28 gigahertz saying that I have minus almost 19 dB of return loss, which in the RF world is pretty darn good. So this uh, mat, this single antenna by itself is pretty well matched. I can look at the Smith chart if you're interested in Smith charts. Simulate measurement. And on the Smith chart, the closer you are to the center of the chart, the better, because that's my 50 ohm match point. And so this is uh, pretty well matched to that 50 ohms. I can also, at this time, to the single patch, add an annotation since I asked it to save the currents. I can go to the antenna. I can add the annotation for the total power for my single patch. And I want it to do on just my sample frequency of 28 gigahertz. I can go okay. And what I see here is an antenna pattern annotation uh, superimposed on my 3D graph that shows the directivity of this patch antenna is going straight up. And I have a little bit of leakage on the backside, which is normal because my ground planes don't extend out very far away from this patch. And so you have some coupling going, going to the backside of this. But the majority of this the signal is going straight up, which I know for a patch is pretty typical. And this gives me confidence that at least this patch at 28 gigahertz works pretty well. But if I wanted to go in and make a quick change to it by making it a little bit larger and re-simulating, you can see that I can get into this what if and cut and try virtually. And I can see that now I have an even better return loss, meaning that it's much lower. It's minus 22 instead of minus 19. So just making this patch a little bit bigger makes it a little bit better matched. So I've improved this design. I can now go to Orlin and say, hey, Orlin, I, I increased this by 0.1 millimeter in both the X and the Y, the patch, or I can export out this geometry as a Gerber DXF or even what's called a GDS file for him. And then he can pull that into his Allegro software or CAD software and incorporate that change into the design. So, that's pretty much the uh, the final validation flow. I validated that at least the single patch works right. I improved it a little bit. I can feed that back to Orlin and the PCB team. 
and then uh, we've made the design better for them. So in the end, I, I just show real quickly that same patch, the, the 3D antenna. Beforehand, I had done a, a frequency sweep, then that same uh, modification where you see that the resonant frequency in blue, the original patch, it was actually resonating more in the 28.25. It needed to be moved down just a little bit for the 28 gigahertz. And then making that patch just a little bit larger, moved it down and gives me this brown trace here, which is a much better match at 28 gigahertz. So then wrapping up, RF design is all about simulation, 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 analysis, analysis, analysis. RF guys will never want to stop analyzing stuff uh, if they can. Um, but in order to do that, you need accurate models, in particular layout-based models for whatever PCB traces are in the RF path of your design. And so today, getting that layout into a tool to do that analysis from a, a tool, uh, enterprise layout tool like ORCAD or LEGO, can be achieved through this validation flow, where we can export out as a Gerber, uh, ODB++ or the IPC specification, and then pull that into Cadence's AWR RF design software, and then do the analysis, see how things work, and then feed that back to uh, the PCB design group to make it even better RF design. Uh, I've included a couple links for um, another presentation that Orlin had done a while back uh, through EMA where he talks more about the PCB designs, grounding, and some tips and tricks. So with that, Brianna. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to open the floor for the Q&A. So Jim, my first question is, what is the time needed to learn how to use the software and what skill level do you have to have? Uh, that's a good question. Certainly some background in RF for the RF tools uh, is needed. However, I, I've seen undergraduate and graduate students using this flow or a similar flow to analyze their designs. So it's not decades of experience uh, by any means. It's um, once you know what's going on, and of course, uh, AWR, King's AWR actually has a lot of good material, training material as well. There are ins and outs of the RF tools and especially the EM analysis software about meshing ports. There are constantly issues with port grounding and where's your ground uh, for these ports. But um, th those can be, le be learned and certainly there's a lot of tips and tricks um, that come with the software knowledge base. Thank you. So next question is, how are the changes made in AWR sent back? Is there a file handoff? Yeah, so right now, it's probably a little bit more disjointed than I certainly would like. You pull in the file with the IPC file format, which is an XML file. You know, it's a single file. And then when you fiddle with it in the AWR software, any changes you make can be then exported out as Gerber. They can be exported out as DXF. And then there's another, there's an IC design format called GDS file format that um, I, I know Allegro can read in as well. But I think eventually what will happen is this flow becomes more and more popular. Um, and especially since Cadence acquired AWR, the flow will become tighter and tighter and uh, more and more seamless in the future. So right now, Orlin on his PCB team would pull in a file, overlay it, and make the changes. But in the future, I suspect what's going to happen is the RF designer is going to be able to make those changes directly to the original full board design. Thank you. So another question we have is, would you go over how the antenna pattern gets created and placed on the PCB? Ah, yes. So it's a trick. So there's a lot of mathematics involved in Maxwell's equations, but once you've actually solved for the matrix for all the mesh points in the design, you then can determine what the RF currents are at all those points. And then with those RF currents at those points, you can 
then use the Maxwell equations computationally to look at the far field pattern, which is what was superimposed on top of the 3D design. Um, it's, it's pretty standard to do that. Uh, a lot of tools will do that with RF currents. What's interesting about the AWR's tool set is, let's say you put in, uh, you know, that there's eight patches on that design. So if you, when you do the full simulation of all eight patches together, you'll have eight ports to access one for each patch. Um, in the AWR tool set, you can then put different um, powers and phases into each of those ports, and it'll automatically calculate the correct RF currents throughout the mesh for that particular case of powers and currents combinations and phases for those ports, which means then the, the antenna pattern reflective of that. So you can do phased array design by then uh, changing the powers and phases of each of those ports. And they have the ability to do that from their system tool, driving the EM document to look at patterns as well as their circuit tool. So you could actually be driving the entire patch array with a real simulated set of power amps on the input of those antennas that are EM simulated. Great, thank you. We have time for about one or two more questions here. Our next question is, for higher density designs, when will more integrated flows be available from the Cadence tool set? Yeah, so I, I think I alluded that a little bit earlier. I would imagine that they're working very hard. They were acquired about a, a year ago by Cadence. They, they have both sides of that house have cracked development teams. And I, I would expect sometime in early or mid 2021, I bet you we're gonna be seeing some really great integrated design flows between the Allegro and the ORCAD PCB tool and, and uh, AWR that's a lot more seamless than using the wizard to pull in the file and then exporting out another file for the uh, PCB designer to pull in. Thank you. Let's see, our last question here is, as a PCB designer, what are the steps adding the pattern? Does it come from the tool you are demoing? So what are the steps for adding the pattern? I'm going to assume that means the, uh, the traces on top. So the traces, well, through the board traces, whether they're on top or, or through the board, are coming directly from the Allegro or the ORCAD, so the, the layout engineer on the PCB side is creating all those patterns. Now, normally, let's say if it's an antenna, certainly I always start with the literature or some of the classical textbooks. There's synthesis tools for doing a lot of these uh, components like antennas, the Wilkinson divider that, that we saw in there, the patches, there's synthesis tools for all that that give you the dimensions. And, and it depends, of course, on the dialectic constants of your board materials and all that. And then uh, you're able to then draw those patterns to create those RF components, and then uh, you can simulate them in the RF tool on the back end and make sure that they work correctly from the synthesis tool. I would also okay. add that uh, if it's done in microwave office, it could be started there and brought into our tool, or I can go into the RF option in our tool create it all here and then send it back. So it can go either way, bi-directional. Thank you. So we have one more good question here that I have to ask. What is the importance of removing solder mesh over RF traces? Ah, that's a, a really good question. So it all comes, well, it comes down to two things. A uh, solder mask is not known for being low loss. So that's one thing. And any losses you can take out of your, in terms of dielectric losses, the material itself, uh, the dielectric is, it's a plastic material from my understanding, and it uh, has RF losses, waves try to propagate uh, through it. Also, the dielectric constant is, we may have a number for it, or we can get a number from the vendor, but you know, how much do you trust that number? Because it will affect, since it coats the RF components, it shifts the parasitics, the capacitances and things like that, and it will affect your design. So not only because of the 
the dielectric constant, but also the thickness. You know, how well is that controlled? Is it one mil or two mils? Or do they tell you it's two mils and instead it's a half mil in that portion of the board? So normally the RF designers, or at least I have in the past, have just requested that the, um, the solder mask be removed just to simplify things and not take any chances. So it's just a, a precaution, really making things simpler and less glossy. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and thank you, Jim, and thank you, Orlin.